going to fulfill its mandate as a public broadcaster with regard to social cohesion and Canadian identity, et cetera, which is what CBC is about, to express our cultural identity. Um, we're going to have to stop it from being a competitor with every other freaking television station out and radio station out there. Well, CBC Radio is doing quite well, but television, competing with CTV, competing with, um, you know, global, competing with all of these great groups, and they have to, therefore, advertise. Now, if you're going to sell advertising, all of a sudden, you become a pop, a pop medium. You got to do what popular people want. And your mandate goes out the window. Because that's why you need a public broadcaster. So it can go to a mandate that is important for Canadians without having to compete in the marketplace for advertising dollars. It puts it at a total disadvantage. It isn't able to do the, the, um, the amount of digitalization it could because it hasn't been given the money for that. CBC has some old antennae that are still out there, which means that a lot of people in parts of Canada, and we are a different country. We're not the United States, we're not Switzerland. We've got the far north, we're getting, you know, having the ability to get signals out there is really difficult, and CBC doesn't have the ability to get the infrastructure to get signals, so little places in Canada are gonna start getting the CBC soon. And that is a real, that is, defeats the whole idea of a public broadcaster. And finally, I believe that we should give, and I was on the, um, Heritage Committee in 2008 when we decided that CBC should be given a new mandate. It should be a 10-year mandate. It should report directly to Parliament. Its mandate should be broad enough that it can maintain the ideas of a public broadcaster, but give it a certain ability to do its own, its own programming uh, without being micromanaging. But that we have to double the CBC's amount to $2 billion. This was in 2008 when I think we had we had left money as a surplus, as liberals, $13 billion where we could have done that. It wasn't done. So now CBC is going to die, and if you want to know how that happened, it's because the conservative government have always disliked CBC. Harper has said so, many of the Reform Party people have always said they want to get rid of the public broadcast. And there's one good way to do it, knowing that Canadians will be upset if it's done, is to bleed it dry. So CBC cannot fulfill its mandate, and when it cannot fulfill its mandate, you gotta say, well, look at CBC, it's useless. It's not doing what it's supposed to do, so let's just get rid of it. And, and that is something that I know that they're friends of CBC, but all of us have to be friends of CBC. And we need to be able to just go really, and this government responds to public pressure. Um, although we continually are told that they now have a mandate from the people of Canada to do whatever they want, Every time we ask a question in the house, that's what we're told. We have a mandate for the people to do this. You've got to fight for CBC because CBC is extremely important to us. Given that more than many countries, we are north of this massive media empire called the United States, and we will lose our sense of cultural identity, our sense of who we are as a people, if we do not have CBC. And I just think it's important for all of us to just go out there and to fight hard for CBC. And you know what? Let's. And stop the jail building here and take some of that money and put it into CBC. Yeah. <laughs>
accumulate all of these changes that have taken place that you realize how much, how fragile media democracy is in Canada. Um, so I would just add that in as another example of the, uh, the power of the cable companies, not only in terms of, of uh, UBB and net neutrality, but also in terms of community programming. Thanks, Lydia. I know you've been standing for a while, but I'm going to call two other people up, and then I will call you next after the So we've got, um, from the BC Library Association, Sylvia Roberts, who will be asking a question. Thank you. Um, thank you for what you had to say. I've got a, a, a question, sort of about institutions and policy. Um, Canadian public libraries are media democratic institutions that offer unrestricted access to a wide variety of information in support of people's studies, work, and other interests. Uh, they play an important role in civic society as a channel for information about political and social issues, to encourage community debate, and helping people make their own choices. In fact, we're all here today in a public library facility. But, um, the, the current uh, Bill C-11, the Copyright Modernization Act that's currently before Parliament, does expand the scope of fair dealing exemptions to include educational institutions, which is great. But it specifically uh, has been suggested by government and by other commentators that education refers to formal education and not to support of uh, lifelong learning in the general public, like public libraries support. So could you please comment on the exclusion of public libraries' educational role from the copyright exemptions, especially in light of their contributions to an informed and effective citizen? All right, uh, Libby, do you wanna start with this one? Well, I'll take a crack at it. I mean, you've asked a very, uh, complex question on a bill that's very complicated. I'm not the critic for this bill, yeah. and I don't know if Hetty is the critic for your party. It is It is a bill that's currently uh, before Parliament. All I can tell you is that our critic, Charlie Angus, who's um, a great guy on his both his understanding and knowledge about copyright, um, we've been opposing the bill because we feel that it doesn't strike the right balance between, on the one hand, uh, um, uh, protecting artistic copyright and, and intellectual uh, copyright, and on the other hand, ensuring that there is uh, overall access for whether it's libraries or educational or informal education. So the bill right now is at committee, is my understanding. Um, uh, actually, I can't remember if we voted on it. It may be on its way to committee, but it's a, it is a very hot subject in Ottawa. There's, there will be a lot of examination of the bill, and I know that the issues that you've raised from the libraries is something that we've incorporated into our analysis of the bill, um, and as the way it is right now, we don't feel that the bill as it is any comes anywhere close to the kind of the balance that needs to be struck. So I, I don't have more, you know, I didn't know we were going to get this question, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. I didn't realize it was part of the debate here today, so I'm happy to get you some more information from our critic, uh, but so I just know about it more generally. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to say that, that this is not just in Canada. There's a worldwide pressure uh, going on with regards to the use of the internet and digitalization, et cetera, and to try to contain it and shut it into a box. I personally believe that, that this is the greatest thing that has happened since the printing press. Oakland maybe since Xerox was pumped. But, but it is the way to disseminate information around the world to people who normally would not have access to information. It is, that's the positive, that's the wondrous thing about digitalization. Now, obviously, as we all know, with good things, there are always negative pieces and one has to find balance. It's like freedom of the press being a democratic right and how do we balance that freedom with a certain ethical mandate. But I think that, for instance, saying that they have broadened the fair rights component is a joke when they have added the digital locks one. Because that cancels out anything we talk about about, about the, the fair dealing and, and, and rights. And so at the moment, what would happen is if I, I mean, and, and for many of you who have read some of history, I used to be the heritage critic uh, in 2007, 2008. And so I, I had gone around the country talking to people about this uh, when the first bill was proposed. And this is really just a, a 
this is the same day over, uh, over and over again. And I think that what we need to do is to, is to think about it. If you, um, it's going to dampen technology. Why would you want to buy X pieces of technology and have it if you can't use it? So this is a technology damper as well as a spread of information damper. But I think that the important thing that, that, that we need to talk about here is that it's going on around the world and we need, we need to discuss what's going on around the world. In Europe now, there's so much concern about putting, trying to put a box around digitalization that in Europe, many groups are calling for access to digital technology and to, and to the internet as a human right. They're bringing this up as a piece of human rights legislation because everyone is so very, very concerned about it. And so, you know, again, we have to see that if, if, if this technology is part of media technology, it is also part of a democratic access that we've got to look at. If it's an information access, then obviously libraries should be able to use that to disseminate information to people because that's part of that democratic thing of, of dissemination of information without fear or favor in a democratic society. But I think there are, there, there, in France now, we've got a three strikes provision. If, you, if, you, if, you, uh, if you've uh, ignored the, their, their copyright legislation three times in a row, then I don't know what they're gonna do, but they're gonna what, stop you from having a piece of technology? I have no idea, but it's called three strikes. And we're seeing this, and this is in response to industry in many instances. There are some real things we need to look at. I mean, I'm concerned about moral rights the right of the creator to be able to create a thing and not have somebody bastardize that thing and then call it a new thing. But there has to be some balance to that as well. And I think many creators, I mean, one of the problems I think with all of this is that we, we don't understand the right of the creator and, and I think versus the right of the people to have information. And These you're are the talking about the balance. creator with the small C. With the small C, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I, I think that one has got all the rights in the world. If, if a creator wanted to use it, the Cap C creator. But I mean, I think the rights of the creator to be able, because we, if you built a widget and you put it out there, look at the technology we're using. You build the technology, you have to buy it. Okay, but if somebody puts their intellectual property into a piece, people seem to think that that's not worth it, that that's not something that we need to protect that intellectual property of the creator. So the, the question of good copyright legislation, which I think needs to be rewritten completely because all Canada is doing is building on the international copyright legislation that the US has and everybody has and trying to lock it down. And we need to sort of throw it away and look at it from a completely new position which says this is here so we can get as much information accessible to as many people as we can. But then how do we protect the right of that small tea creator whose intellectual property is out there protect their moral rights, their ability to create something that's unique and not have someone take it and plagiarize it to the nth degree. Those are the same things we talked about when we first had a Xerox machine. When everybody thought that you, everybody would buy one book and the whole village would print it and give it to each other and they wouldn't buy books anymore. We were able to resolve that problem. Let us really talk about taking this and looking at it from a perspective where we're not buying CDs like when we used to, you don't go out and buy a tape recorder anymore and put a tape on it. The world has changed and I would like to see something like a collective licensing model put forward where, I mean, God forbid we ever talk about putting a levy on something so that that can go into a pot to, to repay the creator like we did with the old tapes. When we had you bought a black tape, you paid a penny on it, that money went into a pot and the, the music creator got a piece of the action. That's the kind of thing we should be looking at and some countries are talking about it now. So I think that that would open it up. Okay, I thank you for that. I'm getting conscious of time. So I'm gonna invite Riley Yo up, another one of the community uh, partners today from Open Media to ask a question on the panel. Hi, first, uh, thanks to everyone for being here today. It's really lovely to have a conversation about politics that's unabashedly from a feminist perspective. And the name of the panel isn't even Women in Politics. So that's really great. Um, I'm really glad that both of you spoke about the importance of open platforms towards the end of the talk today, because at Open Media, what we fight for is the openness of the internet. And we've got a couple of campaigns coming up that are really important to us. I really appreciate Andrea giving us the chance to talk about Stop Spying, um, which is our effort to stop the conservatives' online surveillance legislation. So I'm wondering, uh, from both of your perspectives, what your advice would be for media activists in the next four years of conservative majority about how to reach people, maybe particularly your own constituents who you know best, who may not understand the importance of these kinds of issues? It, it, do what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, the only thing I would 
say, though, is that when you have a petition online, even though the petition is done underneath, under the, you know, the rules of petitions as per the clerk of the House of Commons and the Senate, it doesn't have the impact of tabling it in the House, putting down a piece of paper with all these things. Yet the, the MP who got, gets the petitions gets to stand up and speak to it, it goes into Hanson. Online petitions tend not to do the same thing. It doesn't go into Hanson. It's there, it's collected by the clerk, but it doesn't go into Hanson. So going into Hanson is one thing. It puts it down on paper in, historical, in the historical archives of, of the House of Commons. But I have to tell you a trick that I learned when um, we were doing gay rights and same-sex LBG, LGBT rights when I was in government and the Crutchen government. When you write a letter and you put it in an envelope, you don't have to stamp it because it goes to the House of Commons free of personal charge. And you seal it. Versus when you take a little card that says stop, or, you know, stop online surveillance. Kaboom. Everyone gets the stop online surveillance, they see what it is, it goes in the garbage. Somebody's staffer has to open a letter. Do you have any idea how much time that takes? How that staffer doesn't have the ability to do any other work? How that bombards the Prime Minister's office and the Minister's office and they don't know what to do with 300 sealed letters. Because they don't know what's in it, right? It just says to the member on the front. And they don't know, they've got to open it. And that really does create stress and <laughs> staffing problems within the office. And that is something to do. It's not a social media initiative, but I mean, I think with social media, you just have to keep doing what you're doing. Telling the stories, going out there, giving people informed, keep them, keeping them in, in aware of what's going on. That's a good thing. But if you really wanted to cause trouble, <laughs> the old fashioned mail, snail mail, is trouble. <laughs> <laughs> through to the regular members of parliament. Uh, and you have to be, I mean, there's 308 MPs, that includes the cabinet, um, and you have to be really targeted to think about um, who you're going to uh, target in terms of whether it's in BC or elsewhere across the country. Because, you know, in some ways, the biggest politics that goes on is not what you see in the house. It's actually within our caucuses. You know, we all meet every Wednesday. And it's when we're raising the issues in our caucus that things begin to change. So I, I would even forget about the cabinet ministers and people like that. But when you're getting through to, you know, XMP from Vancouver Island North or Prince George or Port Coquitlam or whatever it is, particularly if you've targeted who it is you think is influential in, the, in a particular region or area, when, when you begin to make some progress with those individuals, and they start raising it internally and saying, hey, look, I'm getting a lot of stuff on this. That's when I think you begin to see a shift. And it's a very systematic, methodical way of working, but it can be done. And we've seen it done on some issues. I'll give you one example. Uh, there was a bill uh, that was going to regulate natural health products. Actually, Tony Clement was the Minister of Health at the time. And there was a huge pushback on it. They had to drop the bill in the end. This was a conservative bill because their own members were beginning to be convinced that it was a bad bill because they had heard from their constituents and they, you know, they, they realized that it, it, was, it was beyond sort of a partisan political approach. And I think if you can, if you can hit that level, which I think you guys are doing already, actually you're, you're well on your way to doing that, so you're definitely on the right track. Um, but it, it's, maybe you've got to be a little more targeted in some of the MPs that you're trying to deal with in each party, um, and I, I really feel like that has an impact. Um, it's not always so easy to see, 
but it definitely is there, and it's definitely um, uh, something that, that will uh, cause um, uh, a, you know, a qualitative change in terms of how the issue is being viewed. I'm dying to ask you if they should get letters or postcards, but um, I won't let you incriminate yourself. I mean, you know, at all levels. I mean, some people are, love to write long handwritten letters, but I would say if you're on social media, like, go for it. Like, most MPs are paying attention to social media, you know? Like, we don't, you know, we are actually part of the modern day age, too. So, you know, mo not all, but most MPs are, are paying attention to that from their constituents, whether it's email. Probably 90% of our of our response comes through email. Um, but, uh, but social media, I believe, anyway, is critically important because you create that kind of buzz and momentum. And because there's, it's the ability to have an instant response, to have back and forth, right? That makes it very dynamic, and it means that you're right on what's going on. And, and so I, I think it's a very important tool. Okay, uh, last question from the gentleman in the government in waiting t-shirt. Um, I'd invite you to the mic. Okay, thank you guys. So I have one question. Mm, before you guys said about women and the vehicles, and my question is that the Canada is a multicultural country, and every year has so many immigrants to come to Canada. So how about the new immigrants to join the politicals and uh, join the social media? And uh, how about them uh, use the social media to to has pay attention to their problems? And the second question is that do you two guys think the MP and NRA sh should use the social media to connect with the peoples and uh, affect the people's opinions and uh, use the social media as a tool to the to improve the Democrats and the you you guys practice the fact. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think two questions. One is around uh, using social media to engage new immigrants in the political process and public policy discussions, and then maybe a yes or no on whether or not MPMLAs should use social media to connect with constituents. Well, um, I, I guess I could go first. Um, I mean, I think the way we relate and interact with our constituents, you, you gotta do it on a whole variety of ways in, in terms of where people are at and, and certainly social media in terms of people who are new to Canada. I mean, there are people on social media, um, but there's gotta be other ways as well in terms of uh, connecting with people. So, I mean, I think that's something that we do all the time. Like I do uh, traveling community offices where I go meet people in different neighborhoods at, at, a, at a public library or in a neighborhood house and meet new people. And maybe because of that, I find out that they are on social media, and then I can I can start following them. Um, and in terms of uh, members of parliament using or, or MLAs or city councillors, I mean, just in the in the civic election here, Andrea, you're really big on 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 social media. I mean, we all use it. It's a fantastic way uh, to to communicate. But the the key thing is communicate. It's not to me. It's not a one way street. If politicians think it's just a way of selling another message then they, they haven't understood what it's about. It's actually a way of responding to people. Um, you, can, you can actually say a lot in 140 characters. <laughs> um, you, can, you can have a lot of back and forth. So I really enjoy it. I find it one of the most uh, kind of engaging and interesting ways of, of having conversations with people. And I learn a lot. I, I learn what's going on, and so I rely on it a lot. And in terms of new immigrants, Livia, I'm assuming that your comments included. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Dr. Fry, you get the second last word next to me. I, I think um, I, I think that, that it is a good way to impact uh, or to, to reach immigrants and to talk with them and to have an interaction discussion. However, there is always that very practical thing. If, if you talk about new immigrants who came in here because they passed the English and French as a first and second language test and they got in, but their families sometimes, the grandparents, the parents, etc., don't speak English or French. Um, and the trick would be how do you connect with them in the line, their language, which I'm afraid I am not fluent in many of them. So then what you do is you lose the thing because you get somebody to do your social media for you, and then it's not really you going back and forth. It's possible, I suppose, one could, 
find ways to do that. But I think, how do you do it on a BlackBerry when I don't know about the Chinese characters and about the Punjabi characters on my BlackBerry? I don't have it. So that's a real problem with people who don't speak the language. Of course, it's a great way new immigrants who are on, you know, and in social media would pick it up immediately. It's a good way to contact, as Libby just said, and to communicate with, um, with your constituents. I tweet all the time, and I blog occasionally um, when, it's, when I can't get it in 140 characters. But I think that the point about it is that there has to be an interaction, as Libby said. There's got to be some way that you feed, get feedback, and you respond to the feedback, etc. I would say that most 90% of people that feedback on my social media are supportive, and then there is the 10% who aren't, and that, those are the ones I like to. We <laughs> have a, a little debate going on there. But I also think that, that on, on, online, and I know the Liberal Party has something called Liberal.ca online, where they, they float public policy issues and they hope to have a discussion on it that people can feed in, not necessarily agreeing, disagreeing, adding pieces, taking out pieces, but to have an online discourse. I think that that's really important not just in terms of getting by on the day-to-day, -day, but in terms of being able to build good public policy and getting it from a diversity of people across the country. <coughs> what is it they really think we should be doing about certain issues? Or to even bring up issues that perhaps the political party is even thinking about as an issue. So it's a good way to do that, and I think that's something that we, we should do. I think social media, of course, has changed the world for us. Can I just make, um, I said earlier that uh, I think we all should support independent media. And I neglected to add Co-op Radio, which I'm a member. Uh, so thank you to Co-op Radio for being here today. It's a very important part of independent media. Thank you. Uh, so just in closing today, um, we're going to thank our panelists uh, in a minute. But I wanted to ask you guys a question. How many of you use the internet today? Maybe a better question is how many of you didn't use the internet today? Okay, so for most of you, uh, this is very directly important, but I would argue it's important uh, indirectly for all of us, the, the issues that we're discussing at Media Democracy Day. In summary of what we heard today, um, I wanted to thank the library, Sylvia, for coming up. Um, when I first started on the Open Data Project at the city of Vancouver, so many people said to me, it's impossible, nobody's ever done it before, blah, 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 and I would say, well, what about... What about a library? <laughs> like, we've had open data in our Western societies for a very long time, and important to remember that um, all of the work we're doing online is rooted in a very positive and understandable experience in our, in our libraries. Uh, we heard about antitrust laws. I'd really encourage you to learn more about them and to become an advocate of them. Uh, somebody said, and I think it was um, Penny, all of us need to be friends with CBC, and Libby added in that CBC needs to be friends with us by having a structure um, that allows the public to oversee it. Independent media, absolutely critical. I'm going to guess most of you are already members or um, participate in some way in independent media, but if you do not, I would really encourage you to do it. Also, um, the number one thing, in my opinion, that you can do, and it made a big difference in my ability to advocate effectively on these issues, is to join openmedia.ca. If you're not already on their mailing list, they are bringing up very topical, timely issues. On the final word on... Um, does it all matter? Should you send letters um, that are sealed or postcards or all of that? Uh, for about 20 years, the last 10 of which I was executive director, I ran an organization called the Wilderness Committee, which largest membership-based environmental organization in Canada and worked to protect uh, biodiversity, so forests, fish, owls, whales, you name it. Uh, and one day I, I came across one of our volunteers who was very upset, who said, you know, this thing got approved, we'll never stop it, you know, and I'm like, you know, we never once in 20 years, never once won a campaign until after the government had approved logging it, mining it, trashing it. So to me, that was just a sign that we were well on our way um, to victory. So it is never too late to get involved in a campaign. The, next week, we have the CRTC coming down um, on usage-based billing. Very important decision to watch. Um, many policies, as you heard, that are before the House, so absolutely get involved and add your own voice to it. I really want to thank... We thanked Elizabeth already, but I also wanted to thank uh, Hetty Fry and Libby Davies for being with us for a big chunk of time this afternoon.
Audrey, I know we didn't say it, but please support your community newspapers because they're not getting very much more funding from the government anymore. Okay, she got the last word. 415, <laughs> Building Media Democracy Plenary. I hope